Hi, I'm Katie Culver, and I'm back with another uh, Media Law Chat. This time, we're talking with Caitlin Carlson about the case everybody loves to hate, <laughs> Snyder versus Phelps. So, Caitlin, why don't you introduce yourself, where you're from, and tell us why you picked this case as a top case. Great. So, uh, I am an associate professor here at Seattle University. Uh, I study hate speech, and so this is one of what I think is the most interesting cases. I really think... Um, you know, I'm somebody who's interested in thinking about how other countries are dealing with the problem of hate speech, as well as how the United States approaches the issue. Um, I, I'm not somebody who's in favor of necessarily government regulation of speech, but I do think there's an opportunity, uh, much like we see for libel or other harms, to have tort law uh, that addresses hate speech. And so I was really hopeful when Snyder happened that this would be a chance for the Supreme Court to recognize um, the emotional harm that that can, can happen to victims of, of hate speech. I'm actually uh, conducting a survey right now asking people about their emotional experience if they've been exposed to hate speech. So, you know, what I think Albert and Julie Snyder went through um, is kind of textbook definition. So I was really surprised and disappointed that eight members of the Supreme Court uh, disagreed, but we are seeing um, some other kind of related cases cropping up uh, in different states. And so, you know, who knows, this may be a pathway forward. Um, there's a, a scholar named Richard Delgado who for years has talked about this, this intentional infliction of emotional distress as a, a recourse for victims of hate speech. Um, and so that's part of the reason I just think this, this case is so interesting. Uh, yeah. It's fascinating and, and troubling, uh, troubling for no small number of people. You know, when the decision came down, Delgado was the first person on my mind. I thought, oh, well, there went, <laughs> right? there went that idea. Um, so so the, let's just really briefly, you know, every, everybody's familiar with the case. The students have all briefed the case. But really briefly, just talk about um, Westboro Baptist Church, so the, the, the Phelps in, uh, in Snyder v. Phelps, and, and what it is that they do that is so particularly problematic. Yes. Yeah, so so they, um, and, and you've probably seen images of this group on newscasts or in, in different places. So they will go to um, events, particularly lately, they have found that they get traction or media coverage when they picket or protest um, at military funerals. So they have signs that say just absolutely abhorred things, God hates this group of people, or um, priests, rape boys, I mean, just really off the wall kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what this, this case is based on. They were at the funeral for a Marine, Lance Corporal Matthew Snyder. Um, they were picketing across the street uh, or on the street adjacent to the, the cemetery where the funeral was being held. Um, and they chose this location. So online, they actually admit that they, you know, they chose this location uh, because they they know or hope that they're going to um, generate some some media coverage for their message, which is essentially you know they're against uh, LGBTQ folks uh, serving in the military. Uh, I'm sorry, my light goes out. Of <laughs> like I don't move too much. Um, so they have issues with um, the morality of folks in the United States. I mean, they're they're trying to make a statement, and you know the big question is you know. Yes, this expression is protected by the First Amendment, um, but like we see with other torts, when that protected expression causes damage or harm to an individual or small group of folks, you know, is there a form of, of recourse? So um, I think it's really interesting. Maryland has a, a, a strict, and it's funny, I'm, I'm from Maryland, so I'm partial, right? Um, so Maryland has a really kind of a high bar in terms of what it takes to prove um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. So let me back up. So um, they go, they protest the funeral. Uh, afterwards, Albert Snyder is having not just an emotional reaction, but physical symptom, right? That he gets so angry, he gets sick or he's, you know, losing sleep, having to, to go speak to a therapist, all of the things that we would actually kind of associate with post-traumatic stress or, or some sort of incident that's really um, set you. And so he's able to document some of these physical symptoms uh, in addition to being able to, to talk about um, just the emotional impact that it's had on him. And so uh, based on that, they sue in a Maryland court for um, intentional infliction of emotional distress, intrusion upon seclusion, 
and uh, civil conspiracy. And it, it's, it's really interesting, I think, that um, a Maryland jury agreed with them, right? So they, a Maryland jury awarded, I want to say it is uh, 2.1 million in punitive damages and 2.9 million in compensatory damages, which is is a good chunk of, of change. And so, um, you know, Phelps, and it was interesting, it's not just Phelps, his daughters are there, it's a family affair. Uh, and so Phelps obviously is upset about the decision and appeals to the Fourth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit ends up overturning it. Uh, Snyder appeals to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court takes the case and we know, and I'm sure you all have seen in other cases you've covered, the Supreme Court takes such a small number of um, cases that are appealed to it. So I, I really get the sense, I can't obviously speak for the justices, but I really get the sense that they wanted to, to make a pretty clear statement that this was protected uh, expression. And so um, essentially when the court takes the case, they're looking at the question of, you know, is this protected expression and therefore uh, can't be the grounds for an, an effective IIED suit. So, you know, the big thing that the majority, so it was eight to one. Um, mm -hmm. Alito is the only person who dissents, which was kind of surprising, actually. <laughs> um, like, interesting. not often, I agree with Alito, but like, right on, man, that, that's <laughs> at least my, you know, my perspective. Um, so basically, the thing that the, the, the case kind of hangs on is the question of, are the statements a matter of public concern? The other thing the court really kind of hones in on is, is not just the, the content and context of, of the speech, but also where it took place. And they're saying, you know, they're on a public street. This is a traditional public forum. Um, even if they chose that location uh, because they knew that it would generate um, media coverage or attention or that sort of thing, that doesn't absolve them of that First Am Amendment protection. And so um, Roberts wrote for the majority, a few other folks concurred, and then, you know, Alito um, comes back and, and I, again, it's not often that I agree with Alito, but he kind of makes this point where it's like, you know, just because, and let me back up actually, um, when we're talking about a matter of public concern, some folks may not agree, like, is it? Yeah, I certainly would say that is the thing that my students bump on the most with this case, that, um, that you know, certainly um, whether we're going to have marriage equality or that sort of thing, those kinds of discussions matter of public concern. But the if you look at the particular signs that Westboro uses, it, you know, they, they they really feel like the court had to strain um, to see this as a matter of public concern. Yeah, and there's a really interesting kind of little nugget in there um, online, right? So they're kind of talking about the protest online. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at one point, they actually mention Albert and Julie Snyder by name. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that question of like, well, is this person right? That it is really about this funeral and this family as opposed to, you know, we're making a statement about uh, morality in the United States or we're making a statement about um, who gets to serve in the military. <sighs> Are you, you know, um, right. that I think for a lot of folks, um, and myself included, is a struggle. And so I, I absolutely agree with your students where it feels like, is this what a, a, a statement on a matter of public concern looks like. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the other issue um, is they, they talk a lot about the fact of like where the protest took place. Oh, and I should mention, I think it's super interesting that after this case, uh, Maryland creates a law that says no protesting in cemeteries, right? Mm -hmm. Where So they come back and create a content neutral law where they're saying, mm, uh -uh, we're not having this. And that obviously is you know, able to pass intermediate scrutiny is is not been challenged in terms of of um, the the law itself. So um, this issue of like, okay, it's taking place. Uh, it's a matter of public concern. It's taking place on a public street. You know, Alito makes the point in his dissent where he says, um, you know, like all of these other unprotected areas of speech, right? Where we're saying, yeah, we can punish libel or we can punish these other things. Um, we don't absolve liability for those things because they take place in a, a public place. So yeah. why suddenly are we doing that for 
um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And then, you know, I, I think the last thing I would mention is just, again, for me, the fact that Snyder is not a public figure, right? So we know with IIED, there's like a, a, a greater standard of proof um, actual malice for if the person's a public figure, but that's mm -hmm. not the case here, right? They're right. just regular folks. And so I don't know, you know, I, I, I understand the, the ruling. I think um, the court wanted to come out and say pretty clearly that regardless of the impact, um, this kind of expression, if it's even adjacent to matters of public concern and, and feels like what we would label as, as hate speech is still protected and continues to be um, protected in the United States. I think one of the things that's been interesting since then is we're still seeing people bring IIED cases um, that, again, feel kind of ancillary to this. Um, yep. So I always think about, I, I don't know if you followed the Gersh case in Whitefish, mm -hmm. Montana, right? So um, here a woman's been awarded, uh, I think, like $14 million dollars uh, by a Montana district judge for um, harm, emotional harm that she suffered. And a lot of her symptoms are similar to what Snyder reports in, in the case. Um, she was the victim of a troll storm by Andrew Anglin, who is the um, webmaster for Stormfront, a white pride website. And she got, you know, 700, I think, uh, phone calls and um, like Twitter messages and stuff like that. Uh, she she's Jewish. There's a whole backstory I won't get into, but um, a, a lot of them hinge on her her being Jewish, and so mm -hmm. they say just absolutely abhorrent things. Um, and the judge there said, you know, these things directed at you intentionally are outrageous. Meet this standard, and and awarded her um, damages. So it, I I still think you know I'm with Delgado. I still think at some point this tort will be a. Um, pathway or a an option for victims of hate speech to pursue yeah you know raising alito it, it was a surprising um dissent like if you had told me that it was going to be eight one he would not have been the one no. <laughs> but when you read it um it actually to me there are sort of the i don't know if it's like the, the ghosts <laughs> of the past um, but the the Stevens dissent in the flag burning case in, te in Texas versus Johnson, where they they seem to be trying to root around and get at this idea that there's there ought to be some means to deal with speech that causes demonstrable harm. Mm -hmm. um, not that they're not that the dissents are exactly the same, but but you know Alito is is saying this is an assault. This is a verbal right. assault. And we ought to be able to deal with that. And what's fascinating to me is the court is basically like as if um, Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire never existed. Like mm -hmm. we, I, I would, I would kill to know where today's court would be, would land on a on a fighting words, something brought as a fighting words kind of case. I don't, I don't think we'd fare well. <laughs> like I think, no. I think no. basically fighting words would be gone. You know, we'd all stop teaching seven areas of speech that get no First Amendment protection, and we go to six. Because I, essentially there is no fighting words protection right now. Right, which is, I think sometimes at least hard, it's hard for me to understand, hard for students to understand to say, mm -hmm. you know, in the past you set this standard and now it feels like it just simply no longer exists. Like, can you think of something that would meet that, you know, and it just doesn't, I cannot picture a scenario where, like you said, we would have a successful fighting words case, right? Right. I had a, I had a student when I was teaching when I was teaching Snyder versus Phelps and I who went back to Chaplinsky and and used the phrase said so I said wait a minute <laughs> like because there pardon the profanity but it was a goddamn racketeer that was those were the fighting words and then the student is sort of looking at these signs on the of of Westboro and saying wait how is that not worse than goddamn racketeer how is that not worse so it's a really they really bump on this case hard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, I think, you know, we're at a time now where there is a, just a strong sense that, um, okay, we, we want to protect these freedoms, but we also want to protect the inclusive nature of our society. And how can we do that? And, and this decision is one where I see the court, the majority saying, yeah, those are lines we can't draw. So we're right. just not going to try. Right. <laughs> you know, it'll be, it will be impossible to come up with a defensible scheme um, for what is a demonstrable harm and what's not. So we're not going to endeavor to do it. Right. Which, 
I don't know about you, but I find that a little bit frustrating because yeah. I feel like there are other places, I'm thinking about obscenity, right? Where we've able, been able to carve out, it's a small thing we've carved out, a little hole, you know, mm-hmm. but, but it is carved out. And so mm-hmm. why, um, the other thing I, I look at, like I said, I, I have looked at what a bunch of other countries have done. So I actually just finished a book about, about hate speech. And I, I look a lot at places like, Germany or Canada or Japan or South Africa. And, and it's certainly not perfect, right? There is this, I think, reasonable fear that carving that, that thing out is going to somehow stifle political dissent, but other countries have found a way to do it. Again, maybe not perfectly, but the thing I always come back to too is like, okay, if really Snyder is about, you know, these matters of, of public concern, you know, fostering public debate on these issues, what about the silencing effect that that kind of expression ha- right like i just feel mm-hmm. like the second you kind of go to that place at least for me I, i'm out right <laughs> like we're not having a debate at that point that's mm-hmm. that's personal or it feels very personal um and so i just you know i and i think you know daniel citron there are folks who kind of have drawn our attention in the past to this this silencing effect and so if really what our concern is about is about promoting democracy and um, inclusion in the democratic process, which is part of what they're talking about here. Um, w- why would we not create a, um, an exception for, for speech that has that effect? So mm-hmm. again, I know it's, it's messy, it's sticky, it's not easy, um, but lots, lots of other countries have, have done it. And I, I appreciate your, and I, I should have mentioned that this idea of, you know, at what point does speech become conduct at which mm-hmm. point, at what point does it become kind of a verbal assault? Um, you know, we talk about personal liberty and all of these reasons we need to protect speech. Um, but there are lots of areas where we say, that's that's not without consequence, right? So again, I, I think about libel, right? Where it's like, if you say something that damages my reputation or write something, you know, I have this form of recourse. Mm-hmm. Why would we not have that? And, you know, it's interesting. I think this case, I, I really like the idea of intentional infliction of emotional distress as a form of recourse for um, hate speech. But there are other places where we could, I think, make small tweaks. I'm sure you guys have been talking about true threats, mm-hmm. right? It, it, it kills me that threats don't um, incorporate the victim's viewpoint kind of thing, right? It's about mm-hmm. what the speaker intended, not necessarily what the receiver interpreted. Um, I think, like we mentioned libel, there are countries like Germany has provisions for group libel. So if you say something untrue, about a large group of people, Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a form of of recourse for that. And we just, we just don't recognize it. So, you know, for me, when, when I teach this and and when we talk about this, you know, I always come back to, I probably take a little bit more critical perspective on the law Mm -hmm. that I just, I I can't help but see that to me, you know, laws are a product obviously of the society, the, the political economic kind of climate at the time. And so, you know, does hate speech or allowing, you know, extreme speech in, in different forms, you know, maintain a, a social structure that works for a lot of, of, of people, right? So um, I, you know, while I'm, I'm disappointed at the Snyder decision, I'm not, you know, entirely um, surprised. But no. uh, it's interesting you mentioned your students too, because I, I'm sure you guys have seen there's a new, Pew had a new study out in the last couple of years where they're saying about 40% of, now this is probably more, millennials than Gen Z, mm-hmm. um, but millennials are open to rules or, or punishments for um, this kind of, of expression in public places. And so, I don't know, like I said, I think it's complicated, it's messy, there's not an easy answer, but just like fighting words has kind of gone by the wayside, things can and do change, uh, right. particularly as the makeup of the court changes. So that would be the other thing that I would mention is like, <sighs> You know, I <laughs> I always tell my students, I'm like, you know, there's more uh, white guys named John that have served on the Supreme Court than all women and people of color combined, kind of thing, right? Like, there's 13 Johns. There's 13 Johns, right? So, 
<laughs> that's a future, funny point. Will we yeah. see something different? Maybe, you know? Yeah, but that's something where Snyder made pretty clear that, you know, what you would consider to be the liberal block mm -hmm. of the court at the time was just not at all interested in this. And that's where, you know, the, as, as I mentioned before, the um, and my students have heard me say it probably way too many times that that First Amendment history is littered with horrible people uh, <laughs> like these like these protesters um, who you know really curdle our blood. But it's also just a case of some really strange clusters on the court and some really uh, interesting people coming together. So, well, Caitlin, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. This is one of my favorite areas to talk about. It's a really tough case for people. Um, to encounter, it you know, kind of shocks the conscience. Um, but I think it's really important for all of us to understand where we stand today and, and where we might be headed. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Absolutely, and in closing, I just, you know, I talk so much about kind of the, the need for some sort of recourse. I also can imagine a, a situation or I kind of cringe at the idea, you know, I don't know that the government is the best group to be deciding <laughs> what counts or doesn't count, uh, especially in this political climate. So who knows where we go from here, but I'm so glad your students and you are, are thinking about this and talking about this. Um, these are just, I think, important issues to wrestle with. And I think this is something that's gonna continue to come up um, in our lifetimes and in their lifetimes. And so I think it's important for them to kind of figure out where they stand. There's no, there's no easy answer on this, but it's good to kind of get to a place of like, Hey, if I if I were writing the rules, here's what what I would be comfortable with. So, thank you so much for having me. All right. Me. Well, it was it was just great to talk to you. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.